Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome to my end of summer TBR. And if you're saying, wait a minute, it's the beginning of August, that is not the end of summer. Mm Hang on. If you ask me, August is the Sunday of summer. If you're a teacher, you know what I mean. You were all students at one point. You know what I mean. August hits, all oh, those feelings, they're coming back. We're also not necessarily calling it a TBR, it's an MBR, as in might be read. These books are books that may be swapped out because I'm also planning on doing the lore quest for Aurelium because Aurelium got bumped from August to September, which is totally fine because technically it is the autumn semester and autumn in September. It just makes more sense. I'm fine with this. We love Gina no matter what. I'll do my favorite readathon whenever she puts it out. Tiny bit more housekeeping when I say MBR. We're also going with kind of a Pirates of Caribbean, completely appropriate for summer, feel for this as in these are not rules, these are more like guidelines because I have had the worst reading year of my life. I don't seem like a girl who read over 200 books last year and I'm aware of that. If you want to skip ahead, this is the part where I'm going to talk about my personal life and explain why that is. Feel free, no hard feelings. I understand if you just want to hear about books. If you do want to know, my health has been absolute crap. Not only do I have a slew of health conditions that I was aware of when I started this channel, but things got really rough this year. In January, I had a cancer scare. Turned out to be PCOS and a really unfortunately placed hernia. Cool. I didn't expect to have a second one still currently going on. We have ruled out stomach cancer, esophageal cancer, a lot of other really unfun things, but we're still ongoing and crossing our T's and dotting all of our I's. My gastroenterologist is like 98% sure you're in the clear. Please also get checked for Ehlers, Danlos syndrome, and maybe see a dermatologist because your skin seems to be reacting to everything ever, including sunlight. I've seen neurologists, I've seen orthopedic doctors, I have gender and back, I have chronic migraine, I have an ENT who's basically on call at this point. I've ruptured my eardrum four times in the last two years. And I've had two rheumatologists entirely give up on me because they're like, you kind of have fibromyalgia, but you kind of don't. We don't know what to do with you because your blood work is a mess. I'm not just waiting for labs and going to doctor's appointments continually. I'm waiting for things like pathology reports, which is absolutely terrifying. And that's why I have to read every sentence four times in order to absorb what is going on in a book. It's been really rough. And I want to say thank you for being there and helping me keep this channel going because this has been the bright spot, the thing that I'm clinging to, the thing that is giving me a sense of normalcy in my life right now. I can't thank you enough. You mean the world to me, and there's so many more of you now than I dared to dream of. Um, but that's why things have, I haven't just been sick. I've been sick, sick, and scared. And um, I literally save your messages sometimes so I can read them in doctor's offices when I'm waiting to hear my fate, my last really big procedure to get things biopsied, um, is second week in September, and I'm hoping, good news, my doctor's expecting Crohn's disease, which at this point would be good news, um, and we can just move on, and I can start to feel better, because I will know how to treat whatever I have. I'm okay for now. It's not like I'm sticking around. Um, I just wanted to let you know why certain videos just never got made, why the library tour that I keep talking about has not happened because I've just been too sick to finish building things and moving all these books hurts. Honestly, I'm, I don't know how I would have gotten through this spring and summer without this channel and you. And I know that sounds crazy, but this is the one thing that made me feel vibrant and alive and special and was a true escape for me. Getting to know all of you um, has meant the world to me. Now, on to my TBR, my MBR, and I'm sure books will be getting swapped in and out as they go through the lore quest because based on things we've seen in the past, I will get away with some stuff, but other things are usually pretty specific. Um, we'll need to find specific things on covers or in titles, a number of words in a title, or an author who starts with a specific letter, so I'm sure you'll see some very random books when I do a wrap-up for this at 
the end of August. For my end of summer TBR, I decided to pick all summery books or books that felt summery to me. Even though I hate summer, I enjoy reading books set in summer or summer-like settings. So here we go. Let's start with romance and things that I might actually read on the beach. So the first one is the one I'm most nervous about, but I do want to mention it. So I read The Perfect Couple by Elin Hildebrand, and I went and bought a ton of her books. I was convinced, oh my god, I love this author so much. It turns out the rest of her books aren't like thriller mysteries, like the cozy ones set in Nantucket. They're just books set in Nantucket. And apparently this was the first one that started all written in 2000. So I kind of want to give this a try, but reading the back of it, I'm also like, it's set in 2000, and one of the characters is described as a man with African-American pride and festering resentment. So I'm a little scared. Basically, it's just one of those books that, like, is all about a whole cast of characters and how they all come together at the opening of this hotel. So with the guy who opens the hotel and has a bunch of secrets, we've got a girl who apparently takes a job at the hotel because she's there with one mission, and that is to find a guy to get her knocked up. We've got the aforementioned African-American, and apparently this season a gun and a woman are going to offer him the chance to um, get even with the man he hates the most. And then we have wild, beautiful, young, 18-year-old daughter of the hotel owners who is about to do something that is going to break her parents' hearts. And finally, the grand dame of the beach club for 45 years, who I don't know what she's going to do, preside over everyone, I guess, but apparently there's a storm coming that's gonna change everything. I do enjoy a good like storm coming in at the beach like that anticipation so I'm gonna give it a try but unfortunately I've only loved One Perfect Couple and it is coming out as a show so if you want to read the book first it is a book first. It's that show starring Nicole Kidman and I think there's a bunch of other stars as well but you say Nicole Kidman and I'm like Moulin Rouge what? So there is my first option. I also pulled out Rebecca Searle's expiration dates. I loved her book One Italian Summer. Not everyone did. That's fine. But this was one of my most anticipated books of the years and I've been waiting till the summer to pick it up. So this is about Daphne and she is hanging out in LA, living her best life, living with her ex. And she has something a little weird about her. So every time she goes out with a guy, she gets a slip of paper with their name on it and a date. And that's basically their expiration date. That's how long their relationship's gonna last. And then finally, she goes on a date one night. I think it's a blind date. And she gets just the name, like Jake, I think it is. Yeah, on the paper. No number, no expiration date. <gasps> what will happen? The only problem is, the further they get into the relationship, the more she's like, man, I don't think I'm right for this guy. Like, there's some stuff about me that if he knew, like, would kind of break his heart. Like, eh, I don't think we're totally compatible. Fate, choice, my money's on the X. I also pulled out because my romance books are in Rainbow Order. <laughs> this with it, and I was like, maybe it's a sign. It's called The Summer House by the Sea by Jenny Oliver. I have no idea where it came from. I have no idea how I got it. Could it be a gift? Could I have thrifted it? Could it have magically appeared on my shelf because I manifested a book at the beach? I don't know at this point, but it's described as the perfect holiday read and I'll wish I was there, so sure. Basically, it's about a girl whose favorite place in the world is her grandmother's summer house in Mariposa and the, off the glittering Spanish coast. And one summer, I guess her grandmother has passed, she decides to return one last time to the house. I don't know if she's gonna sell it or whatever, but she decides to sort of honor her grandmother and throw herself into a project, bringing the cafe that's nearby that they both loved back to life. It's a little run down, it's a little tired. She kind of feels like she's lost her sparkle too. It's the perfect project, grandma would approve. But now that she's away from London, she realizes, oh man, I'm happy for the first time in a long time. I don't know if she's staying, but why wouldn't you? Money. Jobs, right, real life. I also pulled out P.K. Borson's Mixed Signals. She has written one book for every season at Love Light Farms. This is the summer one. If you don't know, Love Light Farms is a Christmas tree farm and it's, it's like super cute and the characters are like super cute and it's cozy and it's a little spicy. Like the best one was the winter one. I don't know if you're gonna beat that because it's a Christmas tree farm. But the second one was cute. So I do want to check out the third one, which totally is water damage because I'm a great big idiot. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this is about Layla. She's the one who runs the bakery in town and it's like famous. Okay. Like her baked goods apparently are like worthy of the gods. Like I want one of her brownies so bad. 
all she wants is a partner who's gonna give her butterflies, okay? But she's really busy with the bakery. So along comes Caleb and he has the perfect proposition. A month of no strings dating. Like, you're gonna go on no bad dates for an entire month. It's gonna be great. He's gonna renew her faith in men and romance and all she has to do is rate his romantic game. He just needs a little, like, help to make sure he's, like, got it going on still. I guess his confidence took a hit. Win-win. All the benefits of dating. None of the pressure of, like, feelings or expectations. Haven't read this plot before. Even the back of the book's like, there's one thing they didn't consider, the chemistry between them. But that's kind of why they're comforting and we love them. I also put in this pile Ashley Poston's A Novel Love Story. I love this author. She may be my favorite romance author. And I got her Once Upon a Book Club version of this book as well as the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition because I'm dumb as a brick and forgot I ordered this until it showed up. But I'm super excited to read that copy of that book and like open little gifts that go along and I might bring you along for that little journey with me. Their stuff is so cute. None of it will spoil the book but it's like some of it will be totally personalized to the book, like there'll be a specific mug that was very carefully described in the book and it will like appear before you in a box. It's really fun. Anyway, a novel love story. You've probably heard me talk about it before. This is about Elsie and like she's about to go to a smut lovers convention. She loves boys and books because they can't hurt you and they're perfect. We get this, okay? Except then her car breaks down, which totally sucks, except it totally doesn't because apparently it breaks down in the town of her favorite book. That's right, we got magical realism here. She is living her best life in Allura Town. She gets to be in her favorite romance series. It feels like home. Everything's perfect there, except it's also perfectly frozen and she's perfectly trapped in a story that has yet to be finished, which is probably perfectly problematic. So she figures that's why she's there. Bring the story to a close. Except there's like this grumpy guy with like green eyes and she like can't quite place him in the story. And she's like, huh, why are you trying to keep me from ending this book? You, you see where this is going to eyes do with this guy. I can't wait to read. I love her writing too. Like, it's just, it's good. And usually I wind up crying at some point, but that's okay. I've been crying all year long. I also am so excited to say this just arrived today from Book of the Month Club. I was like, please, please get here. I need to film this today. Please, please. Tracking, tracking. So, Casey McQuiston's The Pairing. Some things taste better together. Yes, they do. PB and J, vanilla ice cream and hot fudge. And our two bisexual boys right here. So, these two geniuses broke up on a gosh darn airplane over an ocean on a transatlantic flight on their way to their dream vacay. What was it? A food and wine tasting tour all throughout the most romantic cities in Europe. Leo is now a bartender and he's also working on becoming a sommelier, which is like crazy hard. Like, they know their freaking stuff. Kid graduated as the reigning sex god of his pastry school and now works at one of the finest restaurants in Paris. We're happy for both of them. These two brilliant boys also just realized that their vouchers are about to expire because it's been 48 months. Which vouchers in this world are good for four years? I don't know, but they found them, they bought them, and now they both, separately, at the same time, decide they're going to go on a food and wine tour through Europe, together, but not. What happens when they get there? Well, after a few drinks, they decide, let's make a bet on who can sleep with the Italian tour guide first. That was Theo who made that one up. And then Kit's like, nay nay, let's make it a bet to see who can sleep with the most people on this entire tour. That's a great way to prove you're not attracted to each other anymore. I bet there'll be no jealousy whatsoever. Next, Mary Kay Andrews is bringing us the newcomer, which is kind of like a bridge between romance and the thrillers that I picked. Hear me out. Okay, I have a couple of these books because I just really like the covers. It's actually kind of shiny. I like the color schemes. They all kind of look the same. I have several. I just grabbed a random one. So this is about Tanya, right? And Tanya is having a bad day. She found her sister dead in her super fancy townhouse and like she's pretty sure she knows who did it, like her super skeezy ex. And not just because he's super skeezy, but because her sister was like, hey, if anything ever happens to me, it's my super skeezy ex. Her sister made her promise that if anything ever happened, she'd grab her daughter and run. And there's like a to-go bag and everything. So, to-go bag, 
daughter, Tanya, sister's Mercedes. The only clue in that bag, a magazine story about this random beach down in Florida called, believe it or not, Treasure Island. So she's like, all right, I've got a lot of cash and a big diamond ring. I've got Maya, the kid. We're, we're going to Treasure freaking Island. So they head on down there. There is like one hotel. It's got a vacancy sign, but apparently they don't like outsiders a whole time. They're not fans. Mostly the surf, that's what it's called, by like retirees and like the winter birds who head down there. I guess it takes place in winter. Oops. They're like a really close knit group and, and Letty is essentially stuck with like the storage room. Not even kidding. She's trying to do better, trying to get a room, all while figuring out like what the heck happened to her sister, avoiding the skeezy ex, all while trying to avoid the hotel owners son who's sniffing around and just so happens to be a detective. Oh, and did I mention Letty like has some secrets that if like were found out would put her behind bars too? Fun times. Okay, I also grabbed two new thrillers that take place in the summer. First is The God of the Woods by Liz Moore. This was so freaking hyped up. People were like, oh my god, this is as good as like the secret history, which y'all know the literary people are like gagging over that one. Now I've heard nothing. Am I living under a rock? Anyway, this one starts on a nice early morning in August. 1975, we're at a camp and this camp counselor wakes up and finds that one of her campers, Barbara, is missing from her cabin. This is super not good, especially because she is the camp owner's daughter. Ah, uh, yeah, not great. It's especially not good because the kid's brother also vanished 14 years ago, never to be found. That's not really freaking suspicious. Not at all. So the search begins and it's like, blue collar town, super rich family, tensions, lots of secrets to unfold. I think it's like got a lot of social commentary that's going to be happening in here. And I'm very curious to see how the mystery goes. And it's a long book. We also get a bunch of points of view. We're going to be seeing from the detective, the, I think the missing kid's mom, the missing kid's bunkmate, and like the girl she was closest with at camp, and also the camp counselor. So very curious to see how this goes. I'm intrigued. And finally, Ruth Ware, one perfect couple. I could not not pick this up. We've got Lila and she is in a perfect couple with Nico, except it's not so perfect. So her like postdoctorate research is kind of fizzled out. And Nico's acting career is kind of going nowhere fast. So when he auditions for the show, One Perfect Couple, she's like, yes, I'll totally go with you. I'll totally be on the show. And so they're competing for this big prize on an island. And like, they want to be the perfect couple. It's a deserted island called Ever After Island. What could go wrong? Well, the first challenge leaves everybody rattled and angry. Not great. It sounds like good TV though. And then there's an overnight storm where things go from bad to worse because they are cut off from the mainland. They don't have their phones. And suddenly, thanks to the storm, they can't contact the crew anymore. So they are stuck on this deserted island. Just them. Alone. It sounded a little less like Love Island and a little more like Lord of the Flies at this point because tensions are running high. Water supply is running low. And the stakes are sounding a little more like life or death and not like, you know, fame on Instagram. I do love a good Ruth Ware. I randomly picked up The Tobacco Wives by Adele Myers. This is supposed to be really, really good. And I was like, I will put something literary on this list and look smart. This is about Maddie. And she is a promising seamstress who heads on down to North Carolina, which is the tobacco capital of the South, apparently, where her aunt has a thriving sewing business. Great place for seamstress. This is apparently right after the war. So we're like, Finally, over the whole, like, rationing shortage thing. Which war? She's dazzled by the crisply uniformed female factory workers. That's great. Which war? Hidden history of women's activism during the post-war period. Which war? 1946. I'm smart. Anyway. Maddie's all dazzled by, like, the factory workers and the bright uniforms, the palatial homes, and, of course, her aunt's super fancy clientele, the wives of the powerful tobacco execs. Eventually, there's, like, this series of unexpected events. She winds up being, like, headdress maker for all of these super fancy, influential women, and she is now scrambling because the biggest party of the season is coming up, and she's got to make a crap ton of dresses, and they better be ornate. These women high expectations, okay? As she's working though, and we've seen Modiste, we know they get all the secrets, okay? 
she realizes that like right life isn't all it seems to be there's like this trail of misfortune that follows a lot of the women and while well, she's quick to believe like yeah okay it's coincidences <laughs> no no there's actually evidence to prove this is not the case she wants to report it but who do you trust? Who do you tell? And also, everyone's depending on Big Tobacco to survive in the town. And she doesn't really want to destroy the lives of these women with whom she's formed these bonds. Apparently, this will be shedding light on the hidden history of women's activism during the post-war period. I am totally interested in this. And with the uh, election ramping up, this feels like a good way to dip my toe back into some of the nonfiction stuff that I do plan on reading as we get closer to it because believe it or not that is how i relieve my election stress the tobacco wives everyone now on to the fantasy picks okay so i kind of went with a few different themes here we've got like ocean sailing theme and then we've got like set in like warm climates themes because sometimes that does it for me too i like a good like desert setting this time i'm going for more like African Plains settings, I think. So we'll see how it goes. We're starting with Amy Kaufman. I have not heard anyone talking about this, The Isles of the Gods. When I heard about this, I was so excited for it to come out. And like, no special editions, no big like splash. Is it bad? I don't know. This is about Feli, who practically has salt water in her veins, or maybe she actually does. I'm not too clear in the summary here. And she is pissed when her dad leaves her behind to go sailing off into the sunset. She's not staying behind for the winter. She is going to go follow him. That plan kind of goes to heck when her ship gets commandeered by a very handsome stranger with magician's marks. Mm. Apparently this is Prince Leander of Eleanor and he needs to cross the Crescent Sea and fast and without detection so he can complete a ritual on the the gods. Sally's not for this. She doesn't have time for this crap. She's going to escort a spoiled prince to the Isle of the Gods, okay? Even if he does have really good looks. With Titus and Leisure Cruise leads to acts of treason and high terror and the high seas. And now two countries are like on the brink of war. So these two strangers are going to have to get real close. Real fast. Especially when two dangerous gods start stirring from centuries of rest. We wish our Prince and Sally so much fun and those great little bands that keep you from getting seasick. Also taking place on the high seas, we have the Call of the Sea. It's pretty. Pretty, right? Maps on the side. We've got the dazzling cover. And we have nice art. So, what is this about, you're going to ask me? This is by Kate Schumacher, good Jennifer, who's hiding the fact that she's got some magic because that could end her <laughs> in her current world. And so instead of getting to flee town, she winds up accidentally sort of kind of married to a man that she does not love. So she's the rest to forget Ords Merlini. Some of these names are, whoa. The charming pirate who is helping her wield her magic in secret. We've also got Arthur, who never wanted to be in charge, but he's not the chief, so kind of stuck. He's also tried hiding secrets from her, his father, and those get like doubled, tripled when he meets the magic wielder who reveals even more secrets of his past. Eventually, a witch finder finds Jennifer, makes her reveal her magic, and it sets off a chain of events that propel her, Arthur, and Ordy's words into games that have been eons in the making. I don't think they mean Monopoly either. Look, the tropes are fantastic for this. We've got enemies, lovers, Arthurian mythology, adventures on the high seas, pirates, mermaids, sirens, fairies, LGBTQ plus rap, and forced marriage. I don't know how all of this is going to come together. Like, I really don't based on that description, but I'm ready to find out. I also picked up a very nice book that I've heard is deliciously smutty. That's right, y'all. It's finally time for me to read A Ship of Bones and Teeth by Karina Halley. Is her name even on the front cover or do I just know that? I think I just know that. My life is sad. This is about Princess Marin. When she was 16, she sold her soul to the Sea Witch Donia to give up her life underwater so she could be on land with Prince Eric. Guess he regrets her choice because Eric turned out to be an absolute jerk, by which I mean he literally mistreats her. That's the nicest way I can say it. On YouTube. You know what I mean. Marin wants nothing more than to leave this <coughs> cruel prince, if you will, find the sea witch and get her to reverse the stupid spell. And so finally the opportunity presents itself when the prince and princess get kidnapped together by a band of pirates. 
you think this is a bad thing, not for Marin. Despite the fact that they are led by the notorious Captain Ramsay Bones Batista, supposedly he's like the most fearsome, bloodthirsty pirate on the seas, and his ship is like haunted, crewed by the damned, and no prisoner ever escapes. Somehow this still seems better to her. And indeed it is, because fortunately for Marin, he finds out that she has a score to settle with the Sea Witch, and so does he! besties. But Ramsey apparently is the one who gets more than he bargained for because he didn't realize who or what Marin is. Can't blame him for that. But he also underestimated her bloodlust and her desire for revenge. And meanwhile, of course, Marin, well, she's falling for Mr. Pirate and his dark nature. And then she finds out he has a super dark secret of his own. There is a warning in here that is basically like some people call this like basically the other word for smut. If you don't want that, if you don't want all the fun stuff, it is definitely not PG-13. This is dark fantasy corn. That's what it says in the book. Welcome to my channel. Now, Sophie controls the letter to the luminous deep. We're still in the ocean, okay? In fact, now we're down deep in the ocean. And after that last book, that just sounds dirty, but it's not. How pretty, like, right? How absolutely stunningly gorgeous. Okay, so this one is about the mysterious E. She lives underwater and we've got Henry who starts writing letters to her. First they're just writing like scientific stuff back and forth. Then the feels. And then there's a sea quake and they disappear. Totally sucks. Their siblings go on down to investigate what happened. And they find all their letters, their sketches, their notes and realize, oh, they had feelings for one another. And then they find out, oh my gosh, they discovered something that could change the entire world as we know it above and below water. This is gorgeous. It takes place under the sea. And we've got the whole letter writing thing, which we all loved in Divine Rivals. We all loved and you've got mail. How do you go wrong? I also grabbed Goddess of the River if I want to cry. This is the one I'm going to pick up because this is indeed about Ganja, the Goddess of the River. And she is minding her own freaking business, taking care of the mischievous little godlings of the river when their antics annoy a sage. And the sage is like, you, you are not keeping them in check well enough for me. I'm going to curse you to be immortal until you fulfill a whole bunch of obligations, which is stupid because now he's stuck with the little godlings all by himself. But do men ever think, no, they do not. So what does she do? Marries a king and becomes a queen. And she's getting real close to regaining her freedom. In fact, she does it exactly when she gives birth and is thus forced to leave her infant son behind because all of these legends, they love to hurt us and the women in them. Her son, Devavrata, unfortunately kind of carries the legacy of her curse with him. So when he's like, hey, yo, I refuse to become king, he sets off this unfortunate cascade of events that will end in a terrible and tragic war. The book also has the two of them continually seeking one another out and finding each other again and again and again because that bond between mother and son just cannot truly be broken. This one's gonna hurt. But dang, it is pretty. I also pulled. I'm super excited for this one. Like, this is the one I might be, like, most excited for. Like, okay, okay. You ready? You ready? You're not ready. Okay. So, Son of Blood and Ruin by Mary Lee Laris. This one sounds super, super good. It kind of sounds like the Crimson Moth a little bit, but we got, like, the summer heat down in Mexico instead. Hear me out. It's a picture, right? The Empire of Moctezuma. It has fallen. Nobody dares to even whisper the names of the gods or speak of the witches who used to hunt in animal form, the warriors who went sword as eagles, until a new name emerges. A curse on the lips of the Spanish, a hero in the hearts of the people, a mass vigilante, a sorceress with a blade. Pantera. Which I'm pretty sure means panther. But that's like not our only name. Well, no, she's Leonora, a glittering jewel of the court promised the heir of the Spanish throne. The respect of Lady Leonora faints at the sight of blood and would sooner be caught dead than wield a sword. No one suspects that Leonora and Pantera are the same. Leonora has fooled well. And with the powers of her ancestors running through her veins, she's practically invincible. Until an ancient prophecy of destruction threatens and she's forced to decide. Surrender the mask or her life. Isn't that always the way? Women, you just can't gain power. But the legendary Pantera, she says, nay, nay, my friends, I am not destined for an early grave. And when she discovers the truth of her origins, well, seriously, I'm so excited for this one. Look, winning. Sorry, I'm done now. I also picked up Forged by Lead. This has been sitting on my shelves for a while. 
This is by Igor Okusen, and I just haven't heard a lot of people talk about it. I have done a ton of Greek mythology, right? This is based in Nigerian mythology, and it sounds very different, very interesting, and I really want to broaden my horizons a bit. Africa, I think of as pretty dang warm, so that fits with the summer theme. So I thought maybe this would be a good time to check it out. I did hear it was kind of violent though. So that may not be the best fit for me, but we'll see. This is about Demi. And basically she's just trying to like hang out and like get by and survive y'all. She wants to avoid the suspicion of the king who is occupying her homeland, okay? Escape the brutal genocide of her people. See, see where the violence, mm. And live peacefully with her mother dearest who is currently teaching her to use blood magic, which is her birthright. See, blood magic, nervous. But then the betrayal costs her mom's life and Demi wants revenge. I mean, I can't blame her, okay? If somebody hurt my mother, I would not be cute anymore. I would be feral. So she bides her time for a while and finally gets an opportunity when Devious Lord Equenzi says, hey, kidnap the Ahe Prince and bargain to save the remaining Oslo. So her and her childhood bestie Colin set out in this hunt, but it's like, way more dangerous than either of them could imagine. Who's shocked? Nobody's shocked. I'm not shocked. See, she and the prince, not only do they share deadly secrets, but they also share a forbidden attraction. <laughs> Sorry, I'm fine. If she's gonna get justice, she knows she can't trust anyone or anything. Not Colin, not her magic, and not even her own heart. I don't know. If it's not too violent, I think it sounds pretty freaking fantastic. Enemies to lovers every gosh darn time. Forbidden love, like, <sighs> it's so predictable. Look at how detailed these sprayed edges are. Like, look at that, look at that. A little nervous. She looks very comfortable wielding that. And lastly, I chose Feybound by Sarah al -Rifi. I remember reading the first page of this randomly and it talks about the birth of the sun and I just thought, what's more summery than that? about urine. And we're not to a great start in the description, but I know it's going to change fast. So she was like born on a battlefield, has lived on a battlefield, and like assumes she's going to die on a battlefield, which seems like a fair assumption at this point. So she's an elf and she's a warrior in the elven army. And all she's known is violence, but her sister, she's trying to like make better lives for them. Okay, she's trying to work as a diviner and seek prophecies for a better future. We love it, girl. Get it. But then Yuri makes fatal mistake and gets herself exiled. So this prophecy is not going well, I see. And Lettel goes with her into the unknown, <laughs> the dangerous wilderness where they both assume they are going to perish, but instead they stumble upon the fake court, which is supposed to be impossible. They haven't been seen for like a millennium, okay? That, that's a really freaking long time. But they get thrust into their seductive world. We all know what the fake court is, okay? We all know. And they wind up torn between their loyalty to each other, their elven homeland, and even their hearts. I'm excited for this one. Give me a fake court and I'm, I'm good. Look at this. And then we switch to these amazing, like, warm summer vibes. Ugh, love. So this is my maybe TBR, my tentative TBR. My I will be pulling books from this stack and possibly eventually adding if I need to for the lore quest books MBR for August. I'm really excited about a lot of them some more so than others which you probably got this is gonna fall I'm taking this down now because it's terrifying but my mood changes a lot throughout the month so you never know what I really will pick up for all I know I'm gonna be like I want a cozy mystery and we're gonna end up there but that is all for me today. I hope you enjoyed hearing about my books that I may or may not be reading in the month of August. My review of the books that I read for the Library of Dragons Readathon will be coming soon. I had been trying to maybe make an actual physical map because the whole point of that readathon was to create your empire, but um, that's me happening digitally now. And yes, I have to show you the library at some point this month in whatever state it's in because then parts of it are getting torn down for the autumn decorations. I will let you get back to your book and I'll be getting to one of these. Actually, it's like what? I haven't eaten dinner yet and it's midnight, so I'll probably do that first. Then I'll be getting into a book and I will see you all next time. Thank you so much for being here. Please do like and subscribe and leave a comment and let me know if any of these books sound good to you. I'll see you next time. Bye.